So, you've just got your brand new iPhone SE. First of all, congrats. Getting a new phone is always exciting. Just like I did with the iPhone 13 a few weeks back, today we're gonna go back to basics, where I will cover everything you need to know from the iPhone SE's essential new features to showing you how to optimize the iPhone SE in terms of settings, battery life, as well as performance. This is a longer video, but is short when compared to how many hours we all use our phones each day, week, month, etc. Believe me, this video will make your experience better and help you get the most out of your iPhone and iOS. Let's get started. Okay, so to start, let's look at the lock screen. Now to wake the phone, there are a few different ways to do this. And the first is to press the side button that you'll find here on the right hand side of the phone. Simply press this to wake the screen. Now alternatively, you can also use a feature called raise to wake. And this is where the iPhone will automatically detect that it has been picked up and it will wake up the screen. From here, you're gonna have to rest your thumb on the Touch ID button and then click once to unlock the phone. Also on the lock screen, we can swipe to the right to quickly access the camera. This is great if you quickly wanna pull your phone out of your pocket without having to unlock it to take a photo. So now that we're on the home screen, let's take a look at a few essential gestures. First, let's open an app. So I'll go ahead and tap into settings and then to close the app, we're gonna press on to the Touch ID button and then click and go back to the home screen like so. Now to access the multitasking menu, simply double press the home button and this will bring up the following menu. As you can see, we can swipe through to see all of our open apps and this is a great way to quickly switch between multiple apps. So let's say I'm switching between weather uh, and then quickly wanna go back to settings. All I have to do is double press the, uh, the home button to go back to a different app. Also, if I want to close an app that is open, I can go back into the multitasking menu. Again, double press that Touch ID button and then simply swipe up and literally swipe the apps off the screen to close them. And then to access your notifications, simply swipe up from the top middle of the display. And this will bring up the following menu. And then here you will find all of your notifications as grouped by app. And you can also swipe to remove them or launch the application depending on which notification you want to access. And then to leave this menu, we're gonna either press the Touch ID button or Home button or simply swipe up from the bottom of the display. Swiping up again from the bottom of the display will bring up the control center. Now the control center is a great way to quickly access uh, core system functions. So for example, you can turn on and off your Wi-Fi. Uh, you can also have your media controls, change your display's brightness uh, and much more. Now I'll go into uh, later, a little bit later in the video on how to customize the control center. But for now to access this, simply swipe up from the home screen or any other app that you are in. Again, very useful. I use this feature many times throughout the day. Let's take a closer look at the home screen as there are different ways to customize the layout. So if say I wanna change the arrangement of the apps, all I have to do is press and hold on any of the applications until we get this little sub menu show up. And then we can press on edit home screen and you'll see that all the apps and also the widgets will start to sort of jiggle on screen. And this means you can now freely move them. So let's say I want to uh, press and hold on the uh, photo app. I can move it to anywhere I like on the display, uh, top left corner, uh, bottom right. And then once I'm happy with the position, I simply let it go. And then we can go ahead and press into the Touch ID button or again, the home button to lock them into place. Now I'm gonna quickly go back to this menu and we're gonna go once again to edit home screen. And you'll also see that all applications have a little minus icon in the top left. And this will allow you to delete an application from your phone or hide it from the home screen. So let's say I have the Drive app here. Let's say I wanna remove that. I have two options, either to delete the app from my phone. This will permanently remove it from the phone and also clear up some storage or I can also choose to simply remove it from the home screen. This will remove the application from the home screen. So if I go ahead and press the home button here, you'll see that it has now disappeared, but the app itself is still on the phone. So if I go ahead and swipe down from the middle of the display to bring up spotlight for search, I can go ahead and search for drive and you'll see that the application is still there uh, for me to access and open. This may be useful if say you have some sensitive applications uh, like finance or banking apps that you want on your phone, but maybe don't want them prominently displayed uh, on your home screen. Next, I wanna show you widgets. Now, this was a feature that was actually pretty recently announced with iOS uh, just a few versions ago. So once again, we're gonna press and hold on the widget just like we would with any app, and then they'll all start to jiggle. This time, we're gonna look at this top right menu here, which has this little plus sign. And from here, we'll be able to scroll through all the different widgets uh, that iOS has. Now, of course, third-party apps will also have additional widgets, but you can see we have a lot to choose from. So let's say I go into batteries here. 
uh, and we have different widgets, so different sizes. So of course, the larger the widget, uh, the more space it will take on your home screen, but also the more information it will display. So for example, here, uh, it'll be able to show the battery status of not just your phone, but all your other devices as well. Think your uh, AirPods, uh, Apple Watch, etc. And then of course, we have a smaller one uh, that will just show the battery life of your phone. So let's go ahead and select this and then add the widget. And this will then be dropped onto the home screen. And just like with any app, we can simply move this around. Uh, and if we want to move it to the page next to it, simply press and hold it here on the right hand side of the display. It can be a little bit finicky. So let's try that one more time. And there we go. And that will then bring it over to the next page. And just like with an app to remove it, simply press the minus button and that will then remove the widget from the display. And once we're happy with the arrangement, again, simply press the home button to lock everything into place. Let's take a closer look at some settings, more specifically the display and brightness settings. So to access this, we're gonna go into the settings page and then scroll down to where we see display and brightness as there's a few essential features uh, and settings that I wanna take you through. So the first option here is to switch between the light as well as the dark modes for iOS. Now I like to use both, although it is possible to permanently select one or the other. If you toggle the automation button here, this will allow you to cycle between both depending on a few different options. So either set to the position of the sun uh, or to a fixed schedule. So for example, I have my light mode activate automatically from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. basically throughout the day. And then later in the evening or very early in the morning, I like to use dark mode as it's just a little bit less straining on the eyes. So I recommend using automatic uh, and then setting it to a specific schedule. You can also have it go uh, with, the, uh, with the position of the sun. Scrolling down the list brings us to the brightness toggle. So we can go ahead and adjust the brightness here in the settings, uh, but a more easy way and quicker way to do this is in the uh, control center. So again, swipe up from the bottom of the display and then right here we can adjust the brightness. More importantly though, underneath that, we have the option to turn on and off True Tone. As you can see, if I go ahead and turn this off, uh, you'll see that the display gets this almost colder, uh, almost bluish tone. Whereas True Tone, what it does is it will adjust the temperature of the display based on your surroundings. So at the moment in the studio, uh, I have daylight lights shining on my phone. And as you can see, it will make the display just a little bit warmer uh, compared to when True Tone is off. Overall, this makes a display just a little bit more pleasing to look at, uh, so it's something I generally like to have on. The only time where I do turn this off is when I'm editing photos, as this does slightly alter the color reproduction of the display, so in order for it to be most accurate, uh, it is best to turn this off. But again, if you're just consuming content or reading a lot of text uh, for your viewing pleasure, I suggest keeping this feature on. And beneath that, we find Night Shift. Now, Night Shift is kind of like True Tone, uh, but then takes it to a much further extreme. What this does is it will actually actively remove blue light or limit the amount of blue light that is coming out from the display. And this will create, as you can see, quite a strong orange uh, tinge to the display. And this, for many people, can make the screen less, uh, less of a strain to look at, especially at night, uh, as blue light emissions can cause things like headaches, uh, it can affect your sleep. So turning on Night Shift can help limit these effects. Now, just like True Tone, uh, Night Shift will heavily impact the color reproduction of the display. In fact, Night Shift does this much more so. Uh, you can see it really changes every aspect of the way your display looks. So I suggest only using this for certain occasions. For example, I like to use it late at night or early in the morning uh, when I access my phone, again, to limit the strain on the eye. So I have mine set to be scheduled to activate from 10 a.m. on to 7 p.m. You can go ahead and alter this here uh, and also, of course, position it uh, with the sun if you like as well. Just like with True Tone, when you are editing photos, do be sure to turn this off to make sure your display remains accurate. Beneath that, we have the auto lock option, and this will basically mean how many seconds or minutes of inactivity is required for your phone to automatically lock itself. Now, for security reasons and for battery preservation, uh, you can set this to as low as 30 seconds. However, this does mean that your phone will quickly lock itself. So if you find yourself often reading longer articles or you, know, you put your phone away for a second and then wanna get back to it, but without having to unlock it, uh, I suggest turning this down to anywhere from two to, two to five minutes, I would say sort of the sweet spot uh, the only option that I do not recommend selecting is never, as this will mean that if, say, you forget to lock your phone, put it in your pocket, uh, bag, or purse, means the screen will always be on, and not only is this bad for your battery life, but it is also bad for the health of the display, as being on for extended periods of, uh, at a time, especially looking at a static image, is not going to be good for your health of your screen. So definitely keep this 
anywhere other than never. I like to have mine set between two to five minutes, uh, depending on what I'm doing. And then finally is the race to wake option that we looked at earlier, where if you pick up your phone from a table, uh, it will automatically light the screen to allow you to more quickly unlock. Now, if you are very serious about preserving battery, you can turn this off. Personally, however, I like this feature enough to keep it on. Now I'm gonna go back into the main settings page and we're gonna scroll down to control center as this is an important feature, uh, again, that we looked at earlier as a quick way to access those core system functions just with one swipe. Now you can customize exactly what is shown here. So and that's what we do here in the settings. So the first option we have is to allow access within apps. This means when, when you're in another app, such as the settings app here, will you be able to still access the control center? Now, in occasions where you may want to turn this off is if say you are a mobile gamer uh, and say you're often swiping from the edges of the screen and don't wanna accidentally uh, have your game interfere with, uh, with the uh, control center. And these are times when you may want to turn this off. I, however, like to use it often, so I wanna be able to access it at all times, so I keep this feature on. Now you also have the option to turn on and off your home controls and this will take up a pretty big portion of the control center here. As you can see, that's that home button here. Now this is really only useful if you have many uh, home accessories connected to your network. Personally, I do not, so I like to have this off uh, as I don't need it taking up space on my control center. And then beneath that, we can scroll down to all of the included controls and we can go ahead and see them listed here. We can press the minus button to remove them. We can also rearrange them here with this three lined menu. Uh, and as you can see, this will then alter the look of the uh, control center. You're mainly editing this bottom portion here. So these two rows here. Uh, so let's say I just removed the flashlight and I can go ahead and go down to more controls. I can add a new one. Uh, let's say I wanna bring back the torch and as you can see, that will now be added again and we can go ahead and activate this. Uh, but let's say I wanna move this to the top left corner. All I have to do, move it up to the top and this has now been repositioned. While we're on the subject of the control center, one feature that I wanna dive into is focus mode. Now, focus mode is a new feature brought with iOS 15 and is something I use every day. This allows you to set up a range of different profiles depending on what you are doing and each profile will allow you to allow uh, or disallow certain notifications from contacts or apps to come in. So in other words, when you do not want to be disturbed or only want to be uh, or only want to receive those essential notifications, you can activate one of these profiles. So I've already set up these four. So let's go ahead and set up a new one uh, by tapping new focus uh, on the bottom here. And this will launch the settings app where we can now set up a new profile. So we can go ahead and add one. Let's say I want to add one for fitness and let's go ahead and select next here. The first option we have is to select or make a list of specific people from which we want to receive notifications when this profile is activated. So you can have your uh, significant other, your family members, uh, maybe a, a few close friends, uh, or let's say nothing work related, for example. So I'm gonna go ahead and tap the plus button here and I'm gonna go into my contacts and then add a few people. So let's say I'll add this person. As you can see, I now have added two people who can contact me uh, when this profile is activated. Now, separately, it will have the notification for calls, as calls are typically more urgent than, say, a message. So you do have the option to allow calls from either just your favorites uh, or any specific group that you may have in your contacts, uh, as well as everyone. Now, also, if you do turn off, let's say, calls for everyone, so I'm gonna go ahead and select no one, meaning all calls will be blocked. Uh, however, a repeat call will still come through. So especially if it were a more urgent urgent matter, uh, chances are that person is going to call multiple times, in which case that call will be let through. Personally, I like to select this to favorites as I have a smaller subgroup of my contacts. Uh, again, those more important people who I always want to be able uh, to reach me. And then once that's set up, we're gonna go ahead and press allow, and then we can do the exact same thing, but then for applications. Now, this is where I think you can probably be a lot more strenuous uh, as a lot of apps, chances are all of your apps actually, will want to send you notifications. Uh, so let's say here, I'm just gonna be adding some messaging apps. Uh, so let's add messages here. And uh, let's say I have WhatsApp, uh, Telegram, any other messaging apps that I use that are typically more urgent, uh, I can go ahead and allow to come in. Also, we can also separately turn on and off whether we want time sensitive notifications to come in as well. And then once we're done, we'll go ahead and press allow. And then that is it, the profile has now been set up. Now, because this is a fitness profile, we can also have it automatically uh, activate when Apple detects you're doing a workout uh, with Fitness Plus or with, for example, uh, your Apple Watch like I have here. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and skip this for now, but that is an option that you have. And as you can see, the focus profile is now ready. And then if we uh, go ahead and go to the home screen here, swipe back up into our control center, 
tap on focus, we now have the new focus mode called fitness. And once this is activated, you'll see a little icon here on the top left of the display to show that this focus mode is active. Now, one of the neat features as well is if you have multiple Apple devices, once you activate a focus profile on one of them, it will automatically carry over to all of your devices. So it has just been activated on my iPhone SE, on my Apple Watch, on my Mac in the corner there, uh, and on my iPad in the other room. I wanna show you a photo. Let's launch into the Photos app and we'll tap on this most recent photo here. This here is a picture of my laptop screen. And one of the new features that came with iOS 15 is called Live Text. And if I go ahead and tap on the photo here, you'll see this little icon appear in the bottom right of the display, indicating that iOS has detected, uh, detected text on this display. So what I can do is simply press and hold on the text anywhere on the display. As you can see, I can then simply select it uh, and copy and paste it like I would if it were any article online or email or message. This is a fantastic feature. Uh, you can imagine, for example, taking a picture of a slideshow in a meeting room or in your university lecture, a very easy and quick way to copy and paste information uh, without having to manually write this down. So what I can do is simply go ahead and select that, uh, copy that line of text, and let's open up a new note here. We'll go into notes, open up a new note, and then again, double tap, select paste, and as you can see, that will then copy and paste it right into a text format. While we're here in notes, a quicker way to move the cursor around a body of text, of course, one way is to simply tap it uh, with your finger to move it uh, at the start or the end of a word, but let's say you wanna move it to the middle of a word. Well, to do this, simply press and hold onto the space bar, and then we can move the cursor freely. So let's say I wanna put it right in the word space uh, in the middle there, and I can go ahead and add and remove text uh, as I please. So this is just a quicker way to modify text text in a more specific way uh, in notes or any other app in iOS. And then looking at my full list of notes, you can see that I have a few very secretive notes, uh, of course, including this cafe to try note here. Uh, what I can do is press and hold on that note and then select the lock note option. And this means a password or a or touch ID will be required to access and open that note. And this is a great way to protect more sensitive notes though I have seen some people do this and I wanna make clear, this is still not a safe way to store passwords. Never store your passwords in any plain text format. This is more meant for things like uh, addresses, for example, uh, or again, information that you want to be just a little bit more protected. Next, I wanna show you a few neat features in iMessage. So for example here, I've set up a message that is ready to send. Of course, I can go ahead and press the little arrow here to send it, but I can also press and hold on the arrow to access a different menu of effects and different ways to send that message. So one of the cool ones here uh, is invisible ink. This means that the message will appear like this on the display of the receiver, and only once they tap on the message will they be able to actually see the contents. Also, we can go ahead and tap into the screen here, and as you can see, this will come with various different effects as well. Uh, this here previewing how it would look on the recipient's phone uh, when they receive the message. So again, this is a neat way to add a little bit of extra emotion uh, and personality per se uh, to your message, though don't overuse these. And then once you're ready to send, simply press the blue arrow to send. And this brings me to the Safari app. First, to see all of your open tabs, simply press this button here in the bottom right of the display, and this will allow you to scroll through uh, and quickly switch between multiple tabs that you may have open. To close a tab, you can simply press the X on the top right of the tab, or swipe it to the left of the screen uh, to close it. Now, another cool feature is to search for a specific word on a page. So let's say here, uh, I'm on Apple's website uh, showing the iPad Air, and let's say I wanna look for a specific word on this page. To do this, I'm gonna press this uh, menu here in the middle, and we're then gonna scroll up to where we find the option to find on page. And then we can go ahead and type in a word. So let's say I'll type in display. And as you can see, it will then highlight the first result and we'll also show you how many results there are. Uh, we can then press the arrows to quickly switch between them. So this is great if say you have a large article of text uh, and you're looking for a very specific section. Here I have Google Flights open, and let's say this is a website that I access very frequently, I can actually add this to the home screen uh, as an app icon. So to do this, we're gonna go back into that same menu, scroll down, and then we have the option to add to home screen. Right here, it will show you a preview of what the icon will look like. Uh, we can go ahead and rename this, let's say uh, flights, and then we can also customize the URL, and then we'll go ahead and press add. 
And as you can see, it has now just been added just like any other application uh, on our home screen. Now, this is of course not an application. Instead, this is just a shortcut to that mobile web uh, website, but this is a very quick and easy way to access uh, specific websites right from the home screen. Okay, let me show you a few more essential settings. We're gonna go into the settings app here and then scroll down to general and then click on AirDrop. Now, if you don't already know what AirDrop is, AirDrop is a fantastic way to send files between your different iOS devices, from your iPhone to your iPad, your iPad to your Mac. Now, to activate this feature, you will need to either have contacts only selected or everyone. Now, my advice here is to make sure that you do not select everyone, as having it set to everyone means just anyone with an iOS device in public, for example, can identify your phone and request to send you files. Now, don't get me wrong, in order to actually download files to your to your device you will still have to actively accept but it is better to not be identified and found in the first place therefore selecting contacts only means you can only send and receive to and from people in your contacts list and then let's go ahead and take a look at background app refresh now background app refresh is something that will be on automatically for all of your applications but the reality is the majority of your applications probably do not need to be running in the background, taking battery and processing power. So applications like the Apple Store, for example, uh, books, your uh, Google app, these things only need to be running when you're actively accessing and using the application. So I suggest turning this off for any apps that don't require it. Um, I keep it on, for example, for banking applications or messaging apps. In other words, applications from which I always want to be up to date and refreshed when I open them. And this brings us to Siri. So here in the main page of the settings screen here, we're gonna scroll down to Siri and search. Now Siri is useful and it's something that I use every day to set reminders, uh, add a calendar event, but there are many different ways to activate Siri. And the first one is to listen for the activation phrase, hey Siri. This means when you say, hey Siri, Siri will automatically activate. This is useful in a sense that it is hands-free and quick to do, but will also mean that your iPhone will be constantly listening with the microphones on for that activation phrase. And what this means is it will be taking significant amounts of battery life in the background. So my suggestion is to turn this feature off and instead activate Siri by pressing and holding the home button. As you can see, pressing and holding will bring up Siri and then we can press it once again to remove Siri like that. This means the only way to bring up Siri is to press and hold the home button. Now beneath that, we have a very essential setting and that is to make sure that you do not allow Siri when the iPhone is locked. Siri has the ability to read out messages uh, and also send messages and make calls. So in other words, it has access to a lot of your personal information, something you wouldn't want access by someone who does not have uh, your password or is not registered on Touch ID to log into your phone. So make sure that Siri cannot be activated as long as the phone is off by disabling this setting. While we're on the subject of more security related settings, I'm gonna tap into the Touch ID and passcode setting. So I'll type in my password here. And here we have a few essential things uh, that I suggest you turn off. And the first is this menu here, which shows you different settings uh, that you can allow access when the phone is locked. Now, just like with Siri, we again have that option here. I suggest turning off pretty much all of these except for wallets. You wouldn't want someone to access and see your notifications, for example, uh, or access with USB accessories or return calls for that matter. So my suggestion is to turn all of these off. The only reason why I have the wallet on is uh, for public transport, say if I wanna tap in and out of the train system here in London, uh, and still with your wallet, if you are gonna be paying for something, say at the register or with a cashier, it will still require Touch ID to activate even with this setting turned on. And then at the bottom of the page, we have the erase data setting. And this means that with 10 failed password attempts, your phone will automatically restore itself. Now, if say you lose your phone or it is stolen, ultimately what is most important is your personal data and having the setting on means that this will be safe. And then just quickly on battery here, uh, let's tap into the battery setting. My suggestion is to go into battery health and make sure that optimized battery charging is always on. What this means is over time, your iPhone will sort of calculate uh, your charging routine. So let's say you go to bed at 11 p.m., plug in your phone and unplug it at 7 a.m. the next day. This means your iPhone will charge up to 80% uh, starting from 11 a.m. when you plug in your phone and then we'll wait to charge the remaining 20% uh, closer to 7 a.m. Uh, when you unplug the phone. This all serves to, uh, to preserve and extend the maximum battery capacity or your iPhone's battery health. So this is definitely a feature I suggest turning on. Earlier, we looked at background app refresh, and now let's take a look at notifications, as just like with background app refresh, 
as standard, all applications will be allowed to send you notifications right to your iPhone. Uh, and the reality is many applications simply do not need to do so. So my suggestion is to scroll through your list of applications and disallow notifications from any apps that don't need to, uh, to send you them. For example, uh, Netflix or your Disney Plus, right? These kind of content created, uh, content related apps really don't need to be sending you notifications to the home screen. Uh, instead, messaging apps, banking apps, right? More important things, uh, you would want to have notifications come in. So this way, when your phone does go off, you know that it is at least a important notification. Also, you can also have uh, applications send you notifications uh, not to the home screen, but instead only in the notification center, meaning this will not uh, vibrate or make a noise when they come in. Instead, they will be listed here uh, on the notification center that you can say look through once or a few times per day, but otherwise would not disrupt you throughout the day. This is not only good for battery, uh, but also good for your well being. And then last but not least, I want to show you a couple of iCloud settings. So to access this, we're going to tap on your name on the top here. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and scroll down to the device that you're using. So in this case, the iPhone SE. Uh, and then in here, we have two options that I highly recommend you turn on. And the first is find my iPhone. This means your iPhone can be found uh, using other iPhones, using basically Apple's network uh, of iPhones and iOS devices around the world. Again, so if your phone gets lost, you have a chance of finding it. Uh, and then secondly, and perhaps more importantly even, is iCloud Backup. Now, iCloud Backup is probably the best way to back up your phone as this is very seamless. It is done in the background overnight whenever your phone is plugged in and charging. The only downside though is that with iCloud, you only get five gigabytes of data for free. Chances are that will not be enough to back up your phone. So this is where I do suggest buying a little bit of iCloud storage. Uh, as you can see here, I'm on a 50 gigabyte plan and I believe this only costs $1 per month. So what this means is $12 per year to ensure that you always have a backup of all of your iPhone's data uh, in case your phone gets lost or broken. This also means when you buy a new phone, you can simply restore from that latest backup uh, and then pick up right from where you left off. In my opinion, this is a small investment that is definitely worth doing, uh, much more so than, for example, paying extra for Apple Care. And that's it. Thank you very much for watching this video, guys. Let me know if you've made it to the end of this video. Uh, if you do have any questions or feedback, I would love to hear from you in the comment section. Uh, if you haven't seen them yet, I highly recommend watching my iPhone SE unboxing video, as well as my iPhone SE full review video, which is coming very soon. Thanks for watching, guys. Be sure to like and subscribe if this video helped you out, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.